May I have your attention? Sorry about my voice. It is my pleasure to introduce Linda Zarilli today. Linda Zarilli is the Charles E. Merriam Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science in the college. She's the faculty director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality and the author of three terrific books. They are Signifying Woman, Cornell University Press, 1994, Feminism and the Abyss of Freedom, University of Chicago Press, 2005, and A Democratic Theory of Judgment, University of Chicago Press, forthcoming 2016. So really has also written a number of articles on feminist thought, the politics of language, aesthetics, democratic theory, and continental philosophy. We will be treated today to a lecture drawing on her forthcoming book, which I've had the privilege of reading in manuscript form, a tour de force that combines her razor-sharp analytic philosophical skills with her commitments to a vibrant democratic politics. So Rilly's work demonstrates an ongoing appreciation for non-liberal visions of freedom and argues for the importance of political judgment to any enabling forms of the political. Her engagement with Arendt and Wittgenstein in particular, her appreciation for the power and limitations of language, her diagnosis of the contemporary era's specific distortions of debate and adjudication, and her imaginative efforts to find ways out of our current theoretical and practical impasses make her an obviously relevant speaker for 3CT. Indeed, she honors us with our present, her presence today. She is also an indefatigable colleague and a dear friend. And so it's with a special pleasure and with a lot of love that I ask you to please join me in welcoming Professor Linda Zarilli. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this talk. And thank you, Lisa and 3CT, Anwen, everyone who's making this happen. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and uh, I know one, that doesn't sound too good. So I don't like microphones. Um, but I will tolerate the microphone. It's just, it's sort of, you know, I'm getting my voice back to myself. It's kind of an echo situation, but that's fine. Um, so what I want to say is that this talk, yes, Lisa said it exactly, this talk is taken from this book that is actually forthcoming from the University of Chicago Press in 2016, and specifically it's taken from the first chapter of that book. However, since I'm trying to keep to the 45 minutes, and I'm losing some time right now by explaining this, um, I have decided to just take one part of the argument, and I will be happy in the Q&A to talk about the parts I did not discuss if that becomes relevant. However, having said that, it is still far too compressed. What would it mean to foreground the capacity to judge critically as a central feature of modern democratic citizenship? In plural democracies, citizens find themselves called upon to make judgments that require what Hannah Arendt called representative thinking, an ability to imagine how the world looks to people whose standpoints one does not necessarily share. To engage in such thinking is to relinquish one's own concepts as rules with which to judge without conceding that in the absence of rules, one cannot judge at all. The break in tradition and the unprecedented experience of totalitarianism open the modern problem of judgment aren't held, but the irrevocable loss of inherited standards also opened a space for the democratic world building potential of judging anew. However we may share Arendt's optimism, her refusal to regard politics as the exchange of validity claims that can be adjudicated according to shared truth criteria critics charge, leaves her unable to answer the most pressing question for a democratic theory of judgment, how can we decide which judgment is correct? A modern democratic society is characterized not simply by a plurality of comprehensive doctrines, but by a plurality of reasonable 
yet incompatible comprehensive doctrines, writes John Rawls. Given this equal status of competing worldviews, whose criteria should decide? That would appear, appear to be the real problem of judgment. In the texts of neo-Kantians such as Rawls and Jürgen Habermas, judgment is defined almost wholly as a problem of adjudicating value conflicts in the absence of universal criteria and a conception of the good. It is not that these theorists mourn the loss of a common standard. It is not that they mourn value pluralism. On the contrary, they celebrate both as the achievement of liberal democratic societies. This celebratory spirit, however, is tempered by a persistent worry about widespread value differences run amok with parochial perspectives and emotions unchecked by reason. To forestall irreconcilable conflict, neo-Kantians advance different but related ideas of public reason with which they seek neutral grounds to separate by argumentation generalizable interests from those that remain particular, as Habermas puts it. In the view of critics, the idea of public reason is, is symptomatic of the tenacious rationalism of the deliberative model and its failure to grasp the actual workings of political affect. Rather than view political judgment as a conscious language game of giving and asking for reasons, William Connolly, Leslie Paul Thiel, and John Protevi, among others, see it as the modulated expression of the already primed pre-conscious dispositions that are formed through the complex interaction of the social and the somatic. Rooted in theories of body-brain processes, affect is described as a distinct layer of experience that is both prior to and beneath language and intentional consciousness, an irreducibly bodily and autonomic force that unconsciously primes judgment. If judgment is the post hoc rationalization of effective response, they argue, the democratic problem of judgment is not how to adjudicate competing claims, but how to redirect affects through tactical work on dispositions installed below consciousness. For now, they say, it is best to be wary of our capacity for rational judgment, if not to suspend judgment altogether. Now, what interests me in these two broadly construed ways of posing the democratic problem of judgment is less their easily discerned differences than how much they, obvi they um, less obviously share. Political affect theorists share with deliberative Democrats a deep suspicion of our ordinary modes of judging, which they see as intrinsically partial and distorting. Both agree that when it comes to democratic politics, our ordinary criteria of judgment are not good enough and in need of some corrective or supplement. Insofar as this supplement in a plural society cannot take a substantive form of the good, it tends to be construed in neutral or minimal terms be it public reason based on a rule of empty rule of argumentation, Habermas, or an overlapping consensus about justice as fairness, roles, or replacement of reason with the vague conception of a democratic ethos, political affect theory. The distrust of ordinary modes of judging is rooted in a more general distrust of the intrinsic partiality and effective character of the perspectives with which each of us views the world. Now, there is no doubt that our individual perspectives can and indeed often do distort our view of any particular object or that our particular attachments and values can play a large role in such distortion. The issue is not whether our perspectives sometimes or even many times distort our judgment, but whether qua human perspectives, they always distort rooted as they are in our subjective and effective modes of apprehending the world. The view of perspective as irremediably distorting, as James Conant argues, radically departs from the original historical understanding of perspective in Renaissance painting, which lives on in our everyday understanding. On this ordinary account, objects can appear different depending on the conditions and the perspective in which they are viewed. For example, the same coin can, seen, can be seen as elliptical when viewed from the side or round when viewed straight on. Whatever distortions arise from viewing the object from one perspective 
can be corrected by viewing the same object from other perspectives. Judging rightly would involve correcting for distortions in this way. Furthermore, the irreducibly subjective or human dimension to perspective, though it surely can distort, is also crucial to our sense of an object's shared reality and so to objectivity. The concept of perspective, writes Conant, from its very beginning, involves an internal relation between objective and subjective moments in a perceptual encounter between a perceiving subject and the object of his perception. For democratic theory of judgment, the problem with thinking about perspective as irremediably distorting is that it can never quite shake the nagging sense that a plurality of perspectives and effective interpretations, the term is Nietzsche's, though clearly crucial to democracy, is also a real threat to democracy. What could the addition of more perspectives be other than more opportunities to distort? Suspicious of perspective, we are led to think of its corrigibility in terms of something extra, extra perspectival rather than the plurality of citizen perspectives themselves. Both the search to find ever more neutral grounds for democratic justification and the denial that any rational justification can be achieved are symptomatic of a view of perspective and effective interpretations as intrinsically distorting and not corrigible by other perspectives. Perspective is seen as that which is merely subjective in claims to what is objective. Our distrust of perspective reflects thinking about human subjective endowments as limiting our access to how things stand in the world as if we were confined in our current modes of subjectivity absent, that is, the saving supplement. The suspicion with which democratic, my throat is a little, sorry. The suspicion with which democratic, uh, deliberative Democrats and political affect theorists view the particular perspectives that each of us brings to encounters with the world takes the shape of an ongoing oscillation between declaring the impossibility of ever affirming the objectivity of our judgments and recoiling into an ideal of objectivity that democratic citizens really can do without, one that is hostile to plurality insofar as it requires the elimination of any admixture of subjectivity. This oscillation expresses the shared view that the capacity to judge insofar as it operates within the space of reasons must involve the wholly conscious and rule-governed practice of subsuming particulars under concepts. The problem of judgment, as defined and debated by both sides, remains in the grip of the intellectualist conception of knowledge, according to which judgments, to be rational, require that the judging subject disengage its effective propensities and exercise a fully cognitive grasp of concepts as if operating a calculus according to definite rules, to cite Wittgenstein. Failing that, Judgments are little more than the effects of already primed dispositions that lie between the range of consciousness and meaning. Worries concerning what is merely subjective in anything we judge to be objective are visible in the opposition between reason and affect, not only as it maps onto the differences between deliberative Democrats and affect theorists, but more broadly in debates about cognitive versus non-cognitive modes of judging, that is, judgments with a truth evaluable content and judgments without a truth evaluable content. The political stakes of this opposition animate the extensive critical literature on Hannah Arendt's turn to the aesthetic judgments of Kant's third critique. Arendt's idiosyncratic appropriation of Kant can be read as an attempt to think of the problem or rethink the problem of judgment in late modernity beyond the frame of the intellectualist conception, be it the cognitivism of the neo-Kantians or the non-cognitivism of political affect theory. It may seem strange to present Arendt's Kant as an alternative to non-cognitivism since it is non-cognitivism that she seems to embrace. Like Kantian aesthetic judgments, judgments concerning politics cannot be treated as truth claims she holds, for they are not based on concepts or giving proofs. The turn to Kant, says Habermas, is symptomatic of Arendt's broader refusal to provide a cognitive foundation for politics and public debate. According to Ronald Beener, who is the editor of the Kant Lectures, non-cognitivism is just where the problems begin. 
Arendt rejects not only cognition as relevant to political judgment, but also the idea that there is, quote, a distinct faculty that we might identify as political judgment, unquote. She affirms instead only one, quote, ordinary and unitary faculty of judgment, unquote, addressing itself to different objects. Biener's accusing observation turns on the idea that political judgment is political because it takes as its sole object political things. What counts as a political in Arendt's work is notoriously hard to pin down. Let's take the ordinary example of a political election. So a judgment about who should be the next mayor of Chicago would be a political judgment because the office of mayor is a political matter. But there is another way of thinking about what makes a judgment political, and that is when we say that political characterizes the means or process by which the judgment proceeds. So to see the contrast here, you might consider the phrase diplomatic policy. It can describe policies about diplomatic matters that need not themselves be arrived at by any diplomatic procedures, or it can be understood to mean a policy which is arrived at diplomatically. Thus, the notion of political judgment can be understood in two quite distinct senses. Sorry. In the first case, political is that about which a judgment is made, that is, about an external and given object, the office of mayor, for example. In the second case, the political arises as something internal to the very process of judging itself. The key interpretive question in reading Arendt, and more generally for a democratic theory of judgment, I want to argue, is whether the term political refers to a political mode or form of judgment, or only to a particular kind of object or referent that judgments can have. I argue that it is the former, the mode, and base my case on a parallel argument about Kantian aesthetic judgments, but I'm not going to actually make that argument here. That's chapter two. <laughs> so. Uh, even to ask what Arendt means by political judgment is deceptive. Arendt herself rarely uses the term political judgment, preferring to speak of the capacity to judge as a specifically political ability. For her, the political character of judging derives not from its objects, but from the activity itself. That is to say, with Arendt's Kant, the activity of thinking in the place of everybody else. This form of thinking from the perspectives of other people takes for granted that perspectives are corrigible by other perspectives. The objects one considers from these perspectives are not external objects in the way that the office of mayor is. They emerge into view as objects in need of our judgment, in need of the judgment of citizens, only as part of their very process of judging and of a broader process of orienting oneself in what Arendt calls the common world. Quote, the capacity to judge is a specifically political ability in exactly the sense denoted by Kant, namely the ability to see things not only from one's own point of view, but in the perspective of all those who happen to be present, unquote. Arendt's formulations may waver somewhat, somewhat on the scope of the people whose perspectives need to be taken into account, but she never wavers on speaking about judgment as political because of the means or process by which it proceeds, not because it judges political objects that are prior and external to it. If one thinks, with Arendt's critics, that what makes a judgment political is its objects, then it has to seem puzzling to exclude the cognitive dimension of judgment. What else would the faculty of judgment be judging if not the status of these objects? But if one thinks about what is political in judgment as a mode of judging, rather than as a particular kind of object, then cognition is only one way in which judgment might proceed. Arendt does not exclude cognition, but questions the reduction of judging politically to the adjudication of validity claims. On this view, the objects of judgment are already given to us, and judging is a cognitive practice of subsuming an object under a concept. This is the position advanced by the neo-Kantians for whom the whole problem of judgment in plural democracies is how to decide among competing claims about existing objects of judgment in the absence of shared standards. For Arendt, by contrast, the problem 
is how citizens get certain objects into view as objects of judgment in the first place. This is the problem of constituting a common world. Rather than embrace a politically naive non-cognitivism, Arendt takes up Kant to advance a form of interpretive understanding focused on the creation and maintenance of the common world and how it is that new objects of judgment or matters of common concern can come into view for us. Judging constitutes a space in which the objects of judgment can appear. We can now grasp why Arendt's turn to Kantian aesthetics would strike critics as deeply puzzling, for they have a very different understanding of judging. This difference concerns not only the mode versus referent models of judging I just described, but also her critics' strict division between empirical and aesthetic judging, determinative judging, and reflective judging, judging with and judging without the mediation of a concept. But this strict division does not hold in Arendt's interpretation of Kant any more than it does in Kant's own work. The point is not to exclude the relevance of cognition to politics. It is to emphasize the reflective and effective character of all judging. Rather than think of the democratic problem of judgment as the quest for proper criteria to adjudicate value conflicts in the absence of a universal idea of the good, we need to focus our attention on what I shall call the prior question of what it means to have a world in common, a world in which value differences present themselves and are taken up not as mere preferences, but as politically relevant objects for judgment, matters of common concern. Preferences is the problem of what Habermas calls the otherwise impenetrable pluralism of apparently ultimate value orientations, that the deliberative approach would bring into a public language game of giving and asking for reasons. That is another way of saying, rightly, in my view, as in his, that if evaluative judgments are to have any democratic political resonance, they cannot be mere preferences. They must make a legitimate claim to the agreement of others. Now, how can a judgment that is not subject to validation on the basis of proofs make such a claim? Does not Arendt's valorization of opinion rather than truth as a sole coinage of political debate invite the subjectivizing language of value qua preferences the language of value pluralism that in characterizes liberalism. This subjectivizing vocabulary, writes Beener, suggests that value originates not in what is admirable or worthy of being cherished in the world, but in the idiosyncrasies of our own inner life. It has the effect of canceling out the claims to real validity anchored in the world. Talk of values implies that we do not find goodness in the good things in this world, but confer value from our own subjectivity." Unquote. Such talk, he continues, is inseparable from the notion of an exhaustive dichotomy between facts and values. Far from unique to liberalism or any other political form, the fact-value distinction is part of a larger modern way of thinking about the relationship of evaluative thought to the world. It is connected to what Bernard Williams calls the absolute conception of the world, which distinguishes between the world as it is independent from our experience and the world as it seems to us. Adherence to the absolute conception draws a sharp distinction between belief states with cognitive content, which are capable of truth aptly disclosing the world, and <coughs> non-beliefs and belief states which are not so capable. They also distinguish the faculty of reason from that of sentiment. And this, dis this distinguishing and this view of the difference between cognitive and non-cognitive judgments goes on to organize most discussions of ethics, aesthetics, politics, and the difference between these and natural science. It is at the heart of all non-cognitivist approaches in these fields and therefore relevant to Arendt's turn to the third critique. According to J.L. Mackey's well-known error theory of values, for example, value is part of the fabric of the world but the appearance is illusory. Value is not found in the world, it's just projected into it, a mere reflection of subjective response. As John McDowell explains, key to dismissing evaluative thought as anything other than feelings that we project onto the world is the definition of objective. The world is objective on the non-cognitivist account to the extent that it is fully describable in terms of properties that can be understood without essential reference to sentient beings. <clears throat>
This understanding of evaluative states as non-cognitive and devoid of propositional content that could be taken up by other judging subjects rules out the possibility that exercises of our effective or cognitive natures can in some way be percipient or capable of expanding our sensitivity to how things actually are. According to non-cognitivists, genuine, that is to say rational, disagreement over values, be it in the register of aesthetics, morality, or politics, is impossible. Evaluative concepts are mere pseudo-concepts, argued the classic theorists of emotivism, A.J. Ayer, and C.L. Stevenson. But if attitudes, feelings, and preferences are all that evaluative judgments are about, then they cannot possibly count as judgments at all. You might express your attitude, and I mine. But how could we possibly agree or disagree about whether, say, violence against women is wrong? All one can say is, it is wrong or not wrong to me. As Ayer states, one really never does dispute about questions of value. Or as McDowell sarcastically comments, think of the practice of expressing one's attitudes towards various flavors of ice cream. How are we to account for the ordinary experience of disagreeing in our evaluative judgments? For Ayer and other non-cognitivists, such experience exists, but it is not what it seems. In most situations in which we take ourselves to be arguing about values, we're really just arguing about facts, proceeding deductively and expecting others to agree. Quote, and as the people with whom we argue have generally received the same moral education as ourselves and live in the same social order, our expectation is usually justified. But if our opponent happens to have undergone a different process of moral conditioning so that even when he acknowledges all the facts, he still disagrees with us, then we abandon the attempt to convince him by argument, unquote, and may resort to insults decrying his values as inferior, perhaps barbaric. If facts are logically divorced from evaluative judgments, then conflict evaluation is in principle interminable. If we do manage to bring others around to our view, then this can only be by means of non-rational persuasion. That's what Stevenson argued. In that case, there is no substantive distinction between bringing people to change their minds on the basis of reasons and manipulating them in a way that has nothing to do with rationality. Absent any standard of correctness, there is no difference between illusory and non-illusory convictions to speak with Habermas. The question for us now is why subjectivist approaches have such an uneasy grip on us, why they seem at once to speak to and to distort what we are doing when we make evaluative judgments, the kinds of judgments we're called upon to make in a democracy and the kinds of judgment Arendt had in mind when she turned to the third critique. Part of what drives democratic thinkers into a non-cognitivist metaphysic regardless of whether they have philosophical knowledge of such a thing, is something I will not only concede, but strongly affirm. We do not cognize evaluative facts, not in the way the rationalist or strict cognitivist would have it. Notwithstanding our ordinary sense political that political judgments are not cognitions in the strict manner of determinative rule following that guarantees agreement, this table is square, but are rather considered opinions that may conflict, the war, this war is wrong, is also our ordinary sense that not all judgments are equal, some are better and some worse than others, not because one has a better or worse feeling about a particular object, but because one either is or is not, mis is not mistaken about the facts of the case. On the latter point, the emotivists were actually right but they could not see how a feeling could be bound up with discovering how things stand in the world and with rational ways of judging. The whole idea of an emotive meaning reckoned separately from cognitive content, writes David Wiggins, does insufficient justice to our feeling that divergence of attitude must itself be founded in something and not be itself reducible without residue to emotional attitude in something the sentence is about i.e. the intentional character of judgment. As Bertrand, uh, Bertrand Russell remarks, I cannot see how to refute the arguments for the subjectivity of ethical values, but I find myself incapable of believing that all that is wrong with wanton cruelty is that I don't like it. Not liking it is connected with finding it wrong, 
in ways that are no mere phantasm to borrow non-cognitivist Hume's projective figure of evaluative thought. The problem of cruelty or any other matter of common concern is not just that Bertrand Russell, or you or I, does not like it, but that it is not such as to call forth liking given our actually collectively scrutinized responses, comments Wiggins. One could imagine reasons for not caring about the things we do care about, become suspicious of the well-foundedness of the properties that they are key to, but in the absence of such reasons, it's not question begging to remind ourselves of why we do care when we do. We need to develop that thought about the ways in which we do or do not care, do or do not value certain things as right or wrong, just or unjust, such that we can affirm the central role played by our effective propensities for getting the world in view. It is by means of these propensities that we can be brought to care in ways that are public and shared. And this thought might be extended so as to refuse the capital R realism that all too often presents itself as the real alternative to non-cognitivism. To speak with Thomas Nagel, we could affirm that the best or truest view of how things stand in the world is not obtained by transcending oneself as far as possible, and in this way resist what he calls the veracity of the objective appetite. But why are we even tempted to transcend ourselves when we judge? The tenacious sense that evaluative judgments are subjective preferences is linked to the idea that to be rational and objective, they would have to conform to a mode of rule following in which rules for the correct application of concepts are fixed independently of the responses and reactions of judging subjects. It is a view of rationality rooted in the absolute conception of the world where science with its established procedures is the model. Accordingly, observes Stanley Cavell, I quote, the rationality of an argument depends upon its leading from premises, all parties accept, in steps all can follow, to an agreement upon a conclusion which all must accept. What is the significance of saying that a rational argument is one whose conclusion all must accept for thinking about evaluative judgments, asks Cavell. I continue, quote, aesthetic and moral and political judgments lack something. The arguments that support them are not conclusive the way arguments in logic are, nor rational the way arguments in science are. If they were, there would be no such subject as art or morality or politics and no such, no such thing as art criticism, concedes Cavell. It does not follow, however, that such judgments are not conclusive and rational, he says. To assert this rose is beautiful is to posit the necessary agreement of other judging subjects that plays no role in the assertion of subjective preference. I like sparkling wine. This necessity is different in kind from logical reasoning and the giving of proofs, quote Cavell, arriving at conviction in such a way that anyone who can follow an argument must, unless he finds something definitely wrong with it, accept the conclusion, agree with it. It is rather partly a matter of the ways a judgment is supported and in which conviction in it is produced. It is only by virtue of these recurrent patterns of support that a remark will count as aesthetic, as a mere matter of taste, or moral, propagandistic, religious, magical, scientific, philosophical, political, and so on. As Stephen Mulhall parses Cavell, rationality is a matter of agreement in patterns rather than agreement in conclusions. Whether the particular patterns are such that those competent in following them are guaranteed to reach an agreed conclusion is part of what distinguishes one type of rationality from another. But what distinguishes rationality from irrationality in any domain is an agreement in and commitment to patterns or procedures of speaking and acting. Taking up Cavell's alternative, it can be tempting to treat patterns of support as if they were antecedent to anything that could be rationally said, as if they functioned like rules that laid out in advance of actual practices of speaking and judging the grammar of mutual intelligibility. It is tempting because our uses of language are pervasively, almost unimaginably systematic, writes Cavell. What Wittgenstein calls agreement not in opinions, but rather form of life, and not only agreement in definitions, but odd as it may sound, agreement in judgments, can lead us to think that something must underwrite our uses of words. Something must guarantee their normativity. 
Agreement in language seems to attest to the presence of a rule and to our following a rule. And is this idea of normativity not Wittgenstein's legacy? In the longstanding debate over positivism and scientism, Wittgenstein has appeared to many critical theorists as offering an account of normativity that avoids the impossible choice between objectivism and subjectivism. Wittgenstein's account of rules and rule following, it is said, offers a third way that takes into account the subjectivist notion of the unique or meaningful nature of human thought and action without relinquishing the objectivist idea that normativity transcends individuals, their actual practices of speaking and acting. Wittgenstein, then, is seen as replacing the positivist, law-governed, nomothetic view of human speech and action with a rule-governed account that does not reduce meaning to individual subjective states. Habermas's early effort to develop a language-based conception of rationality, for example, credits what he takes to be Wittgenstein's rule-governed conception of language for providing an alternative to the philosophy of consciousness that casts normativity in objectivist law-governed terms. Wittgenstein's agent-centered approach to rule-following, argues Habermas, also avoids subjectivism by showing how tacit knowledge of rules of practical competence guides judging and acting. In the process of acting knowledgeably, individuals draw on an omnipresent, transcendental order of tacit rules that secures the intelligibility of their activities in ways that require, rather than exclude, as did rationalist approaches, their skilled participation without their conscious knowledge or ability to give a discursive account of what they are able to do. The task of the critical theorists Habermas himself, is to give this tacit knowledge propositional form. I want to query the reception of Wittgenstein as advancing a theory of language as a framework of rules and of mutual intelligibility as dependent on rule following. In his later work, writes Nigel Pleasance, Wittgenstein shows that the transcendental inference to hypothetical cognitive powers and tacit rules as entities which must exist in order to account for the meaningfulness of human action and experience, gives a wholly delusory sense of adequate explanation. Meaning is not hidden from us, wrote Wittgenstein. It is not shrouded in a mysterious tacit knowledge of a transcendental order of rules, but plainly open to view in our action. Wittgenstein does not deny that when asked by someone in a particular situation where a particular language game is in play, we may well formulate a rule to describe an activity. In the Blue Book, for example, he speaks about the difference between what one might call a process being in accordance with the rule and a process involving a rule. Whereas the latter refers to actions that are explicitly followed by subjects engaged in a particular practice, for example, if you're a novice learning how to play a game of chess, the former speaks to what an observer of any practice might say when asked to explain what is being done. These are perfectly ordinary ways to speak about what it means to follow or be guided by a rule. In neither case, however, does following a rule require that activity be everywhere circumscribed by rules. And once competence has been established, it seems strange to say that one is following a rule, tacitly or not. To speak with Stephen Affelt, here, the ordinary sense of a rule is philosophically stretched out of shape. Following what I take to be Cavell's lead, I read Wittgenstein not as putting forward an alternative theory of linguistic meaning, of language as a grammatical framework of rules, but as seeking to expose misunderstandings about what kinds of structures must underwrite everything that humans can meaningfully do or say. This non-standard reading is crucial for my rethinking of Wittgenstein's relevance to a democratic theory of judgment. Even as astute a reader as Hannah Pitkin, whose path-breaking book, Wittgenstein and Justice, opened up new ways of approaching basic concepts in political theory and has been a guiding inspiration for my own work, was not immune to seeing in Wittgenstein's account something that transcends and guides language use. Working from what she saw, she took to be Cavell's teaching, Pitkin argued that from the Tractatus to the Philosophical Investigations, Wittgenstein's work is continuous in its, quote, idealist theme, the insistence that our language controls what can possibly occur in the world, 
and that it also provides a framework which governs the possibilities of what we can say about reality, unquote. Although Pitkin recognizes that for Wittgenstein, language is an open system, the grammatical relations among concepts, she writes, quote, might be considered a sort of linguistic Kantianism. What Wittgenstein calls grammatical knowledge very much resembles Kant's transcendental knowledge, and the validity of grammar might well be said to be synthetic a priori, unquote. In this sense, grammar comes to, quote, I'm quoting Stephen Mulhall here, contain or Oh, no, I'm not yet. OK. Um, comes to contain, Pitkin, contain or govern the possibilities of all situations. Knowing the grammar of a word, writes Pitkin, we know what kinds of things are, can be said with it, what would count as appropriate occasions for saying them, unquote. Understood as quasi-transcendental, that is, as logically prior to any particular empirical investigation, and as that which determines a logical space of possibilities for action. As Mulhall, surprisingly, likewise interprets Cavell's Wittgenstein, the grammar of our language starts to resemble the very mechanisms of constraint on human action and speech that Wittgenstein sought to expose as a misunderstanding of ordinary language. The readings of Mulhall and Pitkin are very instructive. They, first of all, they're like some of the best readings we have of Wittgenstein out there. Um, they are also very critical of the idea of language as a prison house of sorts that determines in advance of any context of use what will count as the intelligible use of a word. They would agree, therefore, that when philosophical investigations famously describes how we follow the mathematical rule ad two, Wittgenstein is doing more than questioning a certain way of thinking about rule following entails, that is, the Platonist conception of rules that are like ideal tracks laid out to infinity. He is bringing to light our confusion about the normative power of rules and the fantasies we have concerning the nature of rules that we construct in order to account for that power as we confusedly imagine it. He is calling our attention to how inessential the appeal to rules is as an explanation of language, as Cavell observes, and indeed of our whole conception of mutual intelligibility. And yet their readings, the readings of, P of Pitkin and Mulhall, show how the lure of the appeal persists. And this, too, Wittgenstein invites us to see. He redescribes the lure as the tenacious craving for certainty that gives form to a picture of meaning that holds us captive. But captive to what, a democratic theorist might ask. The picture that holds us captive, language as a framework of rules, matters for a democratic, of theory, a democratic theory of judgment for at least two reasons. It matters first because the idea that something must ground mutual intelligibility in the political realm risks entailing us in fantasies concerning the nature of power of rules that leads us to lose track of our own part or voice as democratic citizens in deciding what will and what will not belong to the common world. And it matters, too, because the power we ascribe to rules is part of what animates the search for criteria that would be appropriate to public debate in a pluralistic liberal society, which clearly cannot adopt a scientific conception of rationality as agreement in conclusions. The idea of public reason as a standard of correctness, of the rules that govern our use of words, that constitute them as the specific uses that they are, that is, as political speech, and in terms of which they can be normatively assessed, democratically legitimate, may seem to be non-tendentious an empty rule of argumentation or a thin concept of justice as fairness. It may not put forward a clearly defined rule meant to cover all possible cases of political speech. Nevertheless, even a thin standard of correctness, as Stephen Affelt reminds us, preserves the thought that there is a job for, and there are things that serve as, explanations or justifications of words and actions apart from the specific situations in which they are employed as explanations or justifications <laughs> in response to specific confusions, doubts, questions, etc. Wittgenstein invites us to question not only the idea that there could be a standard covering all cases, but more importantly, whether something could even count as a standard of correctness of how to go on in the absence of an actual need for some explanation of how to go on in democratic deliberation, 
What are we doing when we provide a template of the permissible structure of normative arguments in advance of any particular arguments? This view of democratic mutual intelligibility commits us to the idea that we must have criteria for every concept and for every use of a concept in judgments that are politically legitimate. It separates out criteria from actual judgments, makes them the ground of such judgments, and in this way assumes that we have criteria for all eventualities. It assumes that a person's divergent application of a word can be corrected by reminding her of its agreed criteria. In this way, Rawls maintains that claims to the truth of one's particular beliefs, for example, belief in God or the metaphysical basis of equality, will not count as proper political speech and ought to be avoided in public deliberations. And in this way, Habermas argues for the radical difference between cultural values and universal norms. But what is to say that truth words or culturally bound values cannot be projected into new contexts and be heard as voicing political concerns based on the patterns of support that Cavell re-described as the rationality of evaluative judgments? Do we really need to have our standards firmly in place for deciding which utterances will count as legitimate, deserving of our response, before anything has actually been said? Cavell's discussion of what he calls projecting a word into new contexts Using words learned in one context and with one sense in other contexts and with related but different senses in other contexts can help us see what is at stake. It can also help us link the previous discussion of the prior question that concerned Arendt, namely how is it that new objects of judgment or common concern come into view for us. A fundamental aspect of language use, the ability to project a word demonstrates one's understanding of its meaning and meaning's responsiveness to the world. I am trying to bring out and keep in balance two fundamental facts about human forms of life and about the concepts formed in those forms. That any form of life and every concept integral to it has an indefinite number of instances and directions of projection and that this variation is not arbitrary, writes Cavell. This twin condition of stability and tolerance, he continues, is what enables one to move from learning to feed the kitty or feed the lion to say feed the meter and be understood. But though language is tolerant, allows projection, not just any projection will be acceptable. Communicate, he remarks. You can feed peanuts to the meter, to the monkey, and feed pennies to the meter, but you cannot feed a monkey by stuffing pennies in its mouth. And if you mash peanuts into a coin slot, you won't be feeding the meter. We should resist the thought that yet another regulative mechanism is in play here, determining in advance of any actual speaking and actual context what will count as legitimate projection of a word and of our own willingness to count this projection in this context. To say that the variation in the projection of words is not arbitrary is not to say that is controlled by something outside speakers of the language what they will count, and the context in which they speak. Rather than criteria or rules that prevent us from speaking intelligibly, when we project a word in this way, it is our ability to properly locate the uses of words in recognizable interests, desires, purposes, forms of life, natural reactions, and so on, Cavell explains. We learn and teach words in certain contexts, and then we are expected and expect others to be able to project them into further contexts. Nothing ensures that this projection will take place. In particular, not the grasping of universals nor the grasping of a book of rules. Just as nothing ensures that we will make and understand the same projections. That on the whole we do is a matter of sharing roots of interest and feeling, modes of response, senses of humor and significance and fulfillment of what is outrageous, what is similar to what else, what a rebuke, what forgiveness, of when an utterance is an assertion, when an appeal, when an explanation, all the world of organism Wittgenstein calls forms of life. Human speech and activity, sanity and community rest upon nothing more but nothing less than this. It is a vision as simple as it is difficult and as difficult as it is and because it is terrifying." Unquote. The terror of which Cavell writes at the end of this marvelous passage, comments McDowell, is a sort of vertigo induced by the thought that there is nothing that keeps our practices in line except the reactions and responses we learn in learning them. 
Cavell seems to offer little more than a lucky convergence of subjectivities held together by a grab bag of effective sensibilities that can hardly claim normativity. How would we know that we are really going on in the same way? How can we know that what we are doing has any correct relationship to reality at all? It is tempting to recoil from this vertigo into a quasi-transcendental idea of grammar or rules that lay out how to go on regardless of whether this felicitous convergence of subjectivities ever takes place. The problem with such recoil is not only that in specifying the conditions for intelligibility, we exclude the radically open aspect of language called projecting a word. The problem is also that we lose track of, or worse, deny, our actual conditions of mutual intelligibility, our own activity in the world of organism that Wittgenstein calls form of life. And though forms of life is a deeply contentious and mostly misunderstood phrase, when seen as dynamic and open, rather than ethnographically static and closed, it indicates not cheerful relativism, but a way of thinking about the imbrication of affectivity and rationality that situates subjective response at the very heart of anything we consider objective. It captures the contingently necessary complex of human relations in which knowing how to go on with the concept is to appreciate how its significant employment is bound up with our interests, desires, purposes, biological and social forms of life and the like. The idea of becoming an initiate in a form of life displaces the focus on rules in Wittgenstein's and Cavell's thought, as it should in ours. It is not that rules do not matter, but they can only matter as part of a larger world of organism in which they have their life. It is only be by becoming an initiate that I so much as know what to do with any rule that presents itself as a way to go on. In a practice, be it a game of chess or a public debate, the focus on rules occludes the crucially important role of voice in speaking intelligibly and judging politically. To speak is to say what counts, says Cavell, is to show your willingness to acknowledge certain things about the world and those to whom you speak and not to acknowledge others. This focus on voice, rather than rules or criteria understood as a standard of correctness for what can be intelligibly said when we speak politically, is crucial to a standard, to a democratic theory and practice of judgment. Saying something intelligible, something that others may not necessarily agree with but can understand why you might say that, requires that you speak in a way that resonates with others in the very specific context in which you speak. But let us not now fetishize context or ascribe to it the power to determine meaning that we just question in relation to rules. As Affelt reminds us, a context is not a room. It is not the fixed container that gives meaning to what we say. For what a context is, what counts as this context, public, and not that context, private, has everything to do with what is said how it is said, and to whom. The relation of the context and the saying, then, is radically dynamic, which does not mean it is indeterminate, as if meaning were always hanging in the air, so to speak. Surely, this must be the first step in moving to an idea of what we might find reasonable or valid, as described by Rawls and Habermas. It is not adherence to rules of public reason, that secure the mutual intelligibility of democratic citizens, but rather mastery of speaking in particular public contexts where the speaking itself shapes one's willingness to count a context and its utterances as public. Almost done. To treat our interests, purposes, desires, et cetera, as part of the life world, Habermas, or the background culture roles, where the rules of public reason do not apply is to distort the grammar of mutual intelligibility. It is to assume that this world, world of organism forms the mere background upon which the putatively real source of that intelligibility, namely rules, rests as if the rules could be pried off the normative background. It is to evade or deny the ordinary. When rules come apart from our interests, desires, and purposes, we are less able to resolve deep disagreements between speakers of a language when they arise. We cannot grasp what a person has said and thus what we are disagreeing about without understanding it as part of those interests, desires, and purposes. We cannot just take the words uttered. For example, God requires us to treat people as equals. 
to see if they meet our criteria of public reason. I cannot know what you have said until I know what you might have meant. And I may misunderstand what you've said or done because I wrongly imagine or take for granted that I know the interests, desires, et cetera, being expressed. What someone might mean points not inward to some private mental realm, but outward to a shared reality and conditions of meaning or common world, a world we have in common on Arendt's account, only insofar as we see it from different perspectives that are not merely subjective, but corrigible by each other. Approaching a divergent speaker in terms of our rules leaves us with little to say in the face of ways of going on, of voicing judgments or political claims that we find problematic or unintelligible in the terms set by those rules. If we then abandon these rules, that alone render speech intelligible according to this model, qua political speech, what other resources will we have to make sense of what the divergent speaker is saying? The speaker will more likely remain opaque and mysterious speaking the language of a worldview whose values we do not share. In the end, we will take to be the disagreement and its, what we take to be the disagreement and its resolution will likely be wholly within the terms of our own position, notwithstanding all sincere efforts to the contrary. Taking into account the desires, interests, and purposes that I've argued to be the real conditions of political life as of human life, of course, in general, does not guarantee mutual intelligibility or skillful judging politically, far from it. But it does allow a pathway into a different way of thinking about the problem of judgment in pluralistic modern societies than that of finding the proper criteria that would correct for the irremediable distortions associated with effective subjectivity or denying the possibility of making judgments that could be anything more than post hoc rationalizations of effective response. Thank you.